So in today's episode, we get into how Andy G is using video content to attract the ideal client type and how he is using it as a hack to live his very best life. Andy G is one of the top video influencers in the country and he's looking at it through the lens of a real estate agent, but it doesn't really matter what type of business you're in or what you're trying to accomplish, he really breaks down some tactile ways that you can incorporate it into your own life and perhaps change the game. He also blew up on Instagram in 2018 and he actually gets right into what he did to get that huge amount of growth. A little bit of housekeeping, we appreciate your attention as always. Smash that like button to make sure you do not miss an episode, we appreciate it. And this is a two-way conversation, so feel free to jump in the comments, ask him questions, I'll link you with him directly, leave comments for future episodes, or guests and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Prime People Podcast where we cover all things that got us to where we are today, our team building strategies, the marketing and sales tips that we've learned through thousands of transactions, productivity tips, ways to really just hold yourself accountable to accomplishing what you want to accomplish and all things content creation, personal development, and not to mention we have some of the best guests on the planet. Hey everybody, love seeing all of you hopping in. This was one of the highest attended webinars I think we've had to date. Just waiting for my man Andy to come on and we will jump right into it. But I see Matt File and a whole bunch of other people in here. Kyle Scott, the man himself. And feel free to jump in the chat and drop any comments or questions in while we're going through this. It's going to be a great episode. I'm not going to spoil it too soon i'm just waiting there's rena the marketing and communications manager for prime she helps run the show and make sure this is all set up properly and she's on the call right now so just waiting for andy to jump on in and we'll get started oh there he is ag how's it going i'm good buddy how are you doing I'm good. I like your setup there. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. If you watch the uh, video I posted today, it was with another real estate agent. You know that trend they're doing on TikTok about, uh, you know, tell me you're a real estate agent without telling me you're a real estate agent. Yeah. This started as my home gym and then slowly morphed into a second office because in this world, we tend to make an office wherever we need one, right? Yes. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Give me one second. I'm just going to go live on the Facebook channel for us and we'll roll right into the episode. But the attendees are piling in. We got Kyle, got a bunch of other people from the program, I think. Melody, Mitch Robertson, he's one of Prime alumni. He is on the call as well. Mitch is a great dude. He was an electrician, became a real estate agent and an investor. And you and Mitch would get along real well, I'm sure. That's cool. Yeah, what's going on in Charlotte? it's it's gloomy out but it's uh it was like 70 degrees the other day i think it's gonna be like 70 degrees this weekend like all my friends want to go golf this weekend it's been pretty nice how are you guys coping with uh everything there is like is everything open i know every time i talk to somebody from a different place it's different uh we are they're shut they're closing things down that's for sure um they put a curfew on us so we have like a 10 o'clock curfew i think for for different establishments but then it's nine o'clock for alcohol so everyone here is flocking to like the beach or to south carolina which is 20 minutes down the street and uh, they're just trying to get wherever they can to have some fun like beach mountains you name it that's interesting and it's such a weird time that we're in right because i mean you're in charlotte north carolina i'm in what let's call it london ontario surrounding region i'm actually a little bit closer to the coast but i'm in canada and even within our province like all the different cities are handling things completely differently and still people are still finding ways to adapt so i mean it is what it is i guess at the end of the day right mm -hmm. yeah and i think that's part of why i wanted to bring you on i know like we know each other very well and we always collaborate and talk amongst the group. And I was watching from a high level of what you were doing. And I was thinking of, you know, the people that watch these episodes and the people I talk to day to day, right? Like when I texted you earlier today and I said, I don't really have an end game. I'm not looking to put people in my funnel. I'm not looking to sell them a course or anything like that. It was literally genuinely just so that you and I could jam and talk about your journey and talk about how you're adapting in the marketplace today. And you know, I know you've gone content heavy in the last little bit and the quality's there. You're investing in the quality. Stuff doesn't come cheap in your time or money, you know, and, and really do a deep dive into that because the names that are watching this and the people that are in other businesses, I think they can take a cue from you and how 
easy it is to do. It's not easy, but you know how accessible it is to the consumer, right? So like the very first thing I wanted to ask you is as somebody that's in this space, how do you find you break through that wall that a lot of people run into where they feel like, oh man, I don't have a video team. I don't have all this equipment. I don't have a you know $10,000 camera and my videos aren't going to look as good. Like roll, let's roll right back to the beginning and, and let's do the origin story of Andy G's content creation. Then we'll do a little bit of a deep dive into you and who you are. Um, I mean, for the video stuff, the video stuff came a lot later. Like Instagram was the big thing to start for me. Um, <clears throat> my whole thought process behind all of that was to just boost credibility. So <clears throat> years ago, when I was in commercial brokerage, because that was where I first started in real estate. And the, the guy that I worked for, he said that in brokerage, you have to have TLC. You have to have trustability, likability, and credibility. And if you're missing any one of those, you're not going to get the client. And so <clears throat> I kind of used that when I got into residential and figured, okay, I have the trust. Like my friends like me, people trust me. Like I'm a trustworthy person. At least I would like to think so. I was raised that way, uh, but I didn't have the credibility yet. So it was like, how can I boost credibility quickly while trying to get deals and close deals, get buyers, get sellers, but also like continue to boost credibility every single day. You know, if I'm not closing something every day, which would be awesome to close 300 deals a year, but I wasn't when I first started. And so I, I still not closing 300 deals a year, but it was, I used Instagram to build the credibility piece because I knew that I had the likability and the trustability. And so with the, to kind of close out the, the TLC, it was like, I used, I turned to social media to be able to do that. So people could see that I was constantly working all the time. Yeah, so. and I think that's something a lot of people don't really understand about why people document their right their lives, right? Is a lot of people are doing it so that they have an understanding of what their day-to-day -day looks like. And it's a different world we live in where, you know, me sharing the behind the scenes of me mapping out how I'm going to execute on a listing while still managing to get a workout in and you know, going fishing and living my life with my family, like the integration of everything is really where the magic is, right? And I think there's a difference between authentic credibility and creating a fake image of who you are online, right? So I do want to delineate the two because I talked about that this morning when I told the audience that you were coming on. I said, Andy's not a guy that goes out and buys 50,000 followers, pretends he's something he's not, takes the photos in front of the Lambo. Actually, you did a Lambo Ferrari video, but it was you, right? Like, how do you not lose yourself like Andy G because you're more than just a real estate agent. You're somebody that, you know, I would want to shop with if I was in that area. So how do you break through that barrier? Uh, when I, so the big thing for me was when I got into residential, I was told that there's, there's no more work life balance anymore. It's just integrating work and life. So it was like, how can I integrate everything that I'm doing? How can I make sure I'm doing stuff that I like? Because that's, that's, I think that's where that makes people stand out is when it's authentic and they actually like what they're doing when it comes to what they're like, their real estate business. <clears throat> and so if you're doing what you like, it comes off so much more authentic. And that's why I always try and do things that I enjoy or like put together things that I, I would, I would want like that's where more recently, like I just rebranded myself and my logo and everything. And it was like, what's something that I would want to wear to a brewery or to a bar or well, before COVID, but like, what was something I would want to wear um, before, like out in the, in the public. And so it's like, okay, now I already have a, a higher, like a, the, I basically, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't know what I'm trying to get at, but like, because it's something not just that, like, I think would look cool. It's something that I would personally want to wear. So that's where with the branding stuff and a lot of the stuff, like even with going and hanging out with the Lamborghini people, like they're cool guys. And so it's like, they're cool guys. So it makes it more fun for me to go work, work with them and talk to them and everything because they're, they really are really cool guys. We have the best job in the world. I was thinking of this the other day, right? Especially for content creation. I'm like, we're involved in the community. We have some really cool transactions that we do. And, 
you know, we're in people's lives on a regular basis. So it's easy for us to turn around and say, Hey, I know those guys are doing something really cool down the street. Why don't we hop over there? And I'll share this with my audience. You get to kind of scratch a little bit of an itch, create that blog, you know, have some fun with the music. You feel inspired about what you're doing. And that's, that's really why I want to showcase you was you're, you're doing the authentic piece without even thinking about the authentic piece, right? Cause you're not, you know, thinking, well, this is the person that I'm, I'm going to showcase to everybody that's out there, attract those type of clients. And they start working with you and you're not really that guy anyways, right? You're just, you know, you feel that it cuts through the noise in terms of, well, that's Andy G. Like if I went down with you and I knew we'd go look at properties, I know we'd end up talking about a myriad of different topics. And I think anybody watching this in any business can feel like they have the best job in the world. Like, you know, if you were a coffee roaster, I'm sure you'd be the same person that would be able to connect me with somebody that has a similar interest to what I do through what you do. So there's really no barriers anymore of being able to go out, create those connections and find inspiring work. But, you know, I gave a little bit of a preamble early on with when we put the invite out and we sent out the information about who you were. So for context, anybody watching this, Andy G has been winning, I think, award after award in the social media space. And you're being super humble about it. I know we've had conversations about it in our private groups. And it's nice to kind of get those acknowledgements. But do you feel like you're just starting? Like, do you feel like all these people watching you thinking, okay, well, th these awards and all these things are great. You know, where are you at in your journey? And, and what are you kind of planning on doing next? I mean, I definitely still feel like I'm starting. Um, it's cool to get these. But also the thing is that people don't see is this is the first that I've got like first year I've gotten a lot of those and I've been doing this for four years. So it's not just something overnight. I mean, even like, you know, we're part of this, the pro membership with Ryan Surian, with Salt Lake Surian. And it's like, Ryan talks all the time. He's like, I have overnight success in 10 years or something like that. He's like, it takes 10 years to have overnight success. So it's like, this is stuff I've been working on for like four years and stuff that there's still so much more to do. I mean, like, yesterday i just posted on my instagram today that i got the top 100 realtors in america on social media or on, on instagram and i got 62 which i was happy that i got 62 because that's like you're right in the pack and it's not like i s skated in at 99 or something <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> it's nice and you know it's it's nice to see the affirmations as you're going through the journey but regardless of if you got the praise or not i know your personality we spoke early on and I know you were cut from the same cloth as I was from the standpoint of how you thought about what you did and whether there's one person in the room or a thousand, I know you're still going to do what you do and keep putting one foot in front of the other, which is why I think we forged a friendship early on throughout that process. And I remember hearing you talk about the Instagram story, right? And I want to take people back to that because one thing that I don't think people realize is they do think it's an overnight success. Right. They think, well, it just it came because you got lucky and you did one post or you had this relationship with this one person. Let's use Ryan as an example. Right. Ryan Sirhan star million dollar listing. He's absolutely crushing it. You know, we work with a lot of people in his world as well. Kyle's on the call, who's his VP of Ventures or president of Ventures. Unreal guy. But look at Ryan compared to everybody else on the shows. Right. Look at the exponential growth that his company and his brand and his identity has because of the work that they put in. And it wasn't overnight. Like it was literally, you look after the last decade, it was the consistency when everybody was probably hating on him and just saying, oh, you're this, you're that, you're just the star of the show. That's why you have your success. Well, not everybody on the show has the success that he has, mm -hmm. right? So when you came into the world of Instagram, what year was it? Like, when did you actually start getting into posting content on Instagram and using that as a vehicle to showcase to the world who you are and what you do? It was like early 2018. So that was when I got featured as a rising star on like a local exclusive real estate magazine. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I need to start building up Instagram and really focusing on Instagram because I just want as many people as possible to see this when I get this magazine published about me or an uh, article in a magazine. But still, it was uh, that it was like early 2018 that I got into it. So let's pause there. The public watching this realizes that Instagram and these platforms, they're your digital business card now, right? And the amount of people, like when I hire people quite often, I'm looking at their Instagram because they can say whatever they want on a CV. Their Instagram feed is going to show me who they actually are. 
So you were thoughtful about it, but how did you break into Instagram in 2018 when it was already an overwhelmingly popular platform? Like, it's not like you just came in in 2010, 2012, got in early and built this massive platform. You know, how did you grow your account so quickly in that time frame? Well, so back then you could do some automation. So this is some of the stuff where it talks about, where we talk about like doing the work versus just hoping that something happens. Uh, so back then you could do some automation. And so I was doing some of like the automated, like following people and unfollowing people and DMing them and stuff like that. But I hired someone who taught me how to do that. And so I had a separate laptop that was connected to a VPN server in Atlanta in a computer farm so that I could run this program that I had to pay for proxies for every month to scramble my location and I had it like working on this computer on this program in Atlanta based on my laptop here in Charlotte. And like, I was constantly tinkering with it and playing around with it to like be able to utilize and kind of get around some of the stuff that Instagram would, would and wouldn't let you do. And so that helped with some of the growth to get started. And then honestly, like to get getting started, that probably got me my first like 10,000 followers, but it, they're real people. And it was, I was able to target in, in a way that I was able to kind of like find real people in Charlotte to start building this following. And then what, along with building the following came wanting to do all the rest of the content creation and all the rest of the stuff. Because the way that I've used social media and all of these different things is that it supplements what I do every day, which is selling houses. Yeah. And it, that's the fun part about life that we're all going into now. We're talking about adaptation early on in this webinar. Before we went live, we were talking about how you're finding new ways of doing things. And your work is a vehicle to develop relationships. Your real wealth comes from the depth of those relationships. It's just how you look at it, right? And realizing early on that you know, these platforms are tools is something ingenious. Because I think a lot of people miss the mark on that where you know they're not just fun things to do and you know all oh, my kids use Facebook I remember when people used to say that in like 2010 I'll never have a Facebook account and now the demo is like 35 to 55 on Facebook and then it was Snapchat and then it was TikTok and look at all the people in our demo that are doing TikToks now and now the kids are just losing their minds because their parents are following them to the places that they didn't think they would ever go right but that's the world that we live in and it doesn't mean that you have to run into all these platforms right I, I do want to give a little bit more value to the audience and discuss how do you pick a platform right because oh you know andy g's on instagram and he's on linkedin and he's on facebook and gary v says i gotta post 175 piece of content, or every, content day. On every, every day on every platform like it's overwhelming and they get paralyzed like how do you pick a platform and how do you make it manageable when life is so crazy these days my advice would be pick one that you like <clears throat> pick one that you like pick one that you know pick one that you're comfortable doing like yeah Usually, I mean, even today, like I, I forgot to when I was at lunch before this, but usually it's like, I'll just take a, the most monotonous picture of something that I'm doing and post it. And it's like, I can do that in 10 seconds. And sometimes I can do it without even people knowing. I've already posted a picture that we're live on here. And you, I don't even know if you noticed that I did it. I had no idea, but I was going to show you this one that I posted yesterday of Kyle Scott. You probably can't see it because of the camera, but it was while we were all sitting down jamming. Right. Yep. I, I didn't even remember I took it, but I remember yesterday I was like, oh, I'm going to post something online. I wonder, you know, I just grabbed my feed and I looked and I'm like, Kyle's a good dude. He works really hard. And he stays really late and he walks the streets of New York. So I, I took my voice to text app and I literally talked about what I thought about Kyle. I'm like, he fires me up. Like dude is at the top of a hill and he could probably stay comfy, but he stays later and shows up earlier. I respect him. Go follow him. And literally just doing that small thing makes me want to be better right like just surrounding yourself with people that inspire you to get better makes you a better person at whatever you're trying to accomplish it doesn't mean you have to sell houses but if you can find passion in what you do and, and integrate that with a habit or some type of content creation around something else that you love i think that's where it's getting real special so you know you went to a was it lambo or ferrari dealership Let's, yeah, let's dig into that. Like that's obviously something you you love and you integrate it into a vlog. So let's talk about idea ideation. How did you come up with the idea for the vlog? How did you actually execute that? And what did it mean to you? So the way that came to fruition though was because I had 
I had a, a seller reach out to me for a very modern, very contemporary house that we were, he was trying to sell uh, in Charlotte. He found me on Instagram and reached out to me. Um, and then as we were, as he was continuing to build the house, I would go check in and meet up with him and take some pictures and post some videos on Instagram. And one of the marketing guys at the Lambo dealership was watching and basically was like, hey man, like reach out to me on Instagram asking if they could do a photo shoot in front of this house because it's a cool looking house that they could take, take, take pictures of the Lambos in front of. And I was like, yeah, that's, that'd be fine as long as I can bring my photographer and I can take some pictures too. <laughs> and, and so we set that up. That was back in January and we all had a blast and I got to meet with a couple of the different guys that worked there and it was, we had so much fun. And so then basically just stay in touch with them. Like I, developed a relationship with them. I'd stop by every once in a while. I'd talk to them all the time. And, and then I had a, <clears throat> I actually had a cool um, listing that I got as soon as I got back from my pro meeting with Ryan in New York. And I, while I was on the listing appointment, I reached out to the Lamborghini guys and was like, Hey, I've got a sick house coming up. Would you want to bring up like a Urus, one of the SUVs out here and we could film it at the, um, as part of the listing video and they were so down for it. So then um, <clears throat> that video turned out really well. And then we, when I went to film recently, I wanted to meet with some local business and I was having a conversation recently before I picked the, to do that video with them. I was having a conversation with one of the, with the GM there and we were talking, it was, and it was just so fascinating how we were talking about the similarities to the real estate market, the residential real estate market and the exotic car market and how days on market or what they have a different name for it, but like how their days on market affect pricing, how their inventory affects pricing, how inventory has been insanely different and insanely low this year for them. Like he was saying that he was selling cars over sticker price, which never happens so, so teach, teach him how to do a bidding war show, show him how to actually deal with multiple offers and send him the broke agent instagram page and he can start living in our world yeah so we, we i was like this would be really cool to do a video with them because we can talk about some of the relationship between the exotic car market and the residential real estate market interesting and it, it, they are very fascinating things right like they're almost identical especially if you're in that luxury category for high-end homes, the customer base is going to be very similar. A lot of the targeting that you're doing, the disposable income, and maybe because people aren't traveling, they're turning around and saying, you know what, if I'm going to be living here and driving around and I just want to spend my money on what I want to drive, right? I'm sure the dynamics of things are changing in their world as quickly as they are ours, but people are people, right? Like, I love how people label other people as, oh, you're, you're just this, or you're just that, right? Or, you know, you're just a guy on TV, or you're just a real estate agent, or you're just a car salesman, let alone you start talking to the guy and you realize that, you know, you share passions and interests and hobbies together that you had no idea. And you're going to talk about everything but the transaction. But when it comes time for you to turn around and buy that Urus, you're going to call the guy and say, hey, can you give me the best price on it? He says, yes, you trust him enough to just show up and then write it down. Like my in-laws, they own a Grogan uh, Ford Lincoln dealership in Watford. So my wife was a dealer principal there. She was just a type personality. That's why she got into the real estate business with me. She wanted to really cut her own way, but she grew up in that environment. And I can tell you, I watched them and they're in a town of about 2000 people. And they're one of the top dealers in all of Canada because people just trust Larry and Jason and all the people there to just call them and say, Hey, I need an F-150. Can you get me the best price? And, you know, they know that they're just going to get taken care of and they could just focus on what they focus on. Right. And you find that now in your career, you get to that point now where a lot of the people you're working with, because you've already built up that rapport and that trust, when you walk in and you're telling them what you think about their house or the transaction or why to buy or why not to buy, there's a different level than when you just got in the business and you were green and you didn't really know what to say to them. Yeah, Absolutely. And that's also, that's a big thing when it comes to just people knowing that they can trust you. That's, that's when the business, I think. So <clears throat> I think there's two different ways that you can build a real estate business. There's marketing based and there's relationship based. And so I built mine with relationships supplemented by some marketing or different types of marketing, but a marketing based business to me is like someone who focuses solely on 
trying to get, you know, a hundred deals a month on Zillow. Yeah. Right. And so having a relationship based business, I feel like if people can trust me, they can call me and they know that I'm going to take care of their friend, their, their aunt, their uncle, their, their best friend, who's looking to buy something in Charlotte, like whatever it is, it's like, they are confident now that they can call me and I will take good care of them. And that then goes back to the videos because it's like pictures say a thousand words or a picture says a thousand or a picture says a million words, whatever the saying is. It's like, but a video will say a million more. Mm -hmm. You can tell, right? When you're communicating with somebody, the reason I videotape these is people can see our body language. They can, you know, if you're listening to the audio podcast, that's great, but there's something intangible about doing it on video where you see expressions and people that wear their heart on the sleeves, I think they're the ones that do really well in the relational business and they hit the nail on the head. Like from a marketing and sales perspective, I tell people all the time, like if you love cold calling, you love lead gen, do the Zillow, do the Facebook leads, do what you enjoy. Like there's a guy on my team, we joked about it the other day, he's big smile on his face and below the Instagram post, you couldn't see his hands. I'm like, I bet you he's got five phones and he's calling 150 people because it brings him joy and it's great to listen to him because I can genuinely hear he's trying to serve people in those phone calls, but that's not me. All right. And that's not you. And when we talked, I, I remember our first conversation, I said, I'm like, I asked you where you were going with your business and we were talking like high, high level. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, everything you're doing speaks to how I run my business and how I'm trying to build my community. It almost feels like, yeah, I got this cheat code where you're out shooting videos and creating content and you're like, should I even really be here? Like it has a massive impact on your business. The consumer may not understand it. Your broker may not understand it. Your wife may not understand it, but you look back two or three years and you realize the phone calls that you're getting in the relationships you're building, you know, you're at a house, you get a call from a guy at an exotic car dealership. Well, guess what? Now, if somebody walks in is buying a car from him and says, Hey, I need to buy a house. Who's his first phone call or, Who's the video that he's pulling up on YouTube sending to that client saying, you need to see this house that Andy just listed. These are real things that happen. And I don't think the general public understands to what level it happens. And it used to be, you get a deal from Instagram, maybe you get a lead from Facebook. And now it's shocking to see, are you finding a big shift in the marketplace in terms of how creating content is creating actual business? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, I got kind of lucky and obviously these stories don't happen every day, but the very first video that I posted um, in Uptown Charlotte was a terrible video. It was not very good. And uh, one of my friends posted it on his Instagram and his neighbor saw it and she wasn't really, she didn't really like her realtor that much. And she reached out to me the next day and we were under contract two weeks later. It's, it's a real thing. I had a story yeah. early on in my career when I started doing video and it was a good friend of mine who used to work and she was a grade one teacher. And she had a smart board, a YouTube smart board. And I think when we were doing Google pre-roll YouTube ad against interest, she was logged into her YouTube account. So she was in the age range and the demographic that would be buying this nice condo that we had listed. And her grade one class had to watch my video and the <laughs> advertisement that I did. And I laughed. I was like, did you pull me any buyers? Long story short, though, you think about these people, they go to, say, a dinner party and run into somebody else. It's extrapolation, right? So, you know, one question I'd love to ask you more for selfish reasons is, you know, there's you in your work mode and there's you in your life mode. I know we're talking about the integration of the two, but there is a time where you put on, say, your real estate agent hat and that set of expertise and get laser focused on that. And then you shift into the marketing mindset. How do you manage shifting between the two and still managing to, to get super deep on the real estate side and then laying that over to, you know, the marketing and sales tactics that you're developing? Boy, I wasn't ready for that one. <laughs> What's that? I said, I wasn't ready for that. That's a good no, question. That, that's okay. It's just, I, I know your life, right? And I can tell when you sit down and you're hammering through comps and stuff like that, and all the language that we know as agents, that's one person, right? Mm -hmm. But then you bring in this creative aspect to it and start creating content around it. You know, how do you find you can still be the best realtor that you can be while being this marketing maven these days? Well, I guess to answer that part, I would say that a lot of it has to do with hiring the right people and working with the right people because I'm big on like earlier this year, I, I bought my first house and renovated it. And I figured 
I'm in real estate. I can renovate it. I work with builders. I work with GCs. Like they'll help me. I'll hire my own subs and I'll sub it out and save some money and renovate this house. And guess what? I will never ever be doing again. <laughs> that. That's because, awesome. because I was, I learned that like, you just need to stay in your lane and like, we're good at selling houses and doing the marketing and all that kind of stuff. And uh, when it comes to doing video and all these things, like I have people that I work with who help me. So, you know, I already, I had like an intro call or like our, we call it like our brain dump call for my next day of filming this morning. And we took an hour and then the person, the, the girl who I was on the phone with sent me an email with the things that she needs from me by Monday. I'll send it to her by Monday. And then she puts the whole schedule together for the day. I wake up in the morning, they show up and we, we know exactly where we're going, when we're going there and what I'm going to be talking about. And Genius, so, right. And we built a house and it was kind of the same thing. I said to my wife after we were done, I'm like, I just pay somebody to do it next time. Cause in the, the, the money that I saved in it, I'm like, I could have made five times that if I just focused on what I do or just did something that I found more enjoyable than, managing trades and, and speak in that language because every every niche is its own language right so let's loop back to the content side of things because i know a lot of people watching this are, are very curious about content creation working with other people working with a team you know not everybody has a team and you can totally do content without a team you go back to andy's early stuff you go back to my early stuff it was this it was me with a shaky camera bad lighting terrible audio still did it and then learned the skill set yeah you got long arms, dude. It would show real well for you. Um, so you don't, you do not need to have a team. You don't even need to have fancy equipment. That I promise you. But once you get a little cadence and you start finding that magic sauce, I think what you can do is you can turn around, maybe upgrade your audio, your lighting, then start thinking about a team. So when you first started building your team for content production, what was your first phone call? Like, how did you go out and source somebody? And then what would that vetting process look like for you? Um, well, I'll say too, for getting started, like <clears throat> when I first started in real estate, I was literally just taking selfie videos outside of open houses. And, and I looked like a loser standing outside of the house in front of the for sale sign. And I'd have to try it like five times. And you stand out there and you're like, hey, I'm Andy. I'm over here at 123 Main Street. I'm going to be here on Saturday at two o'clock for an open house. You should come by. and I had all these videos on my phone saved of that. And like, you just, but the thing is, you just have to start somewhere. You don't need the best camera or the best uh, lighting or the best uh, audio or microphone or team or videographer or anything. Like just go out and start doing it. And so then when I decided I wanted to actually start doing video, actually the guy who owns the video company is FaceTiming me. Right? Ah, that's amazing. Uh, You're welcome to answer and throw him on the show if you want, if you want to ask him about that relationship. You can kill me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'll just tell him I'm, I'm in a meeting. Yeah. Uh, but when it came to, okay, when I was like, okay, I want to hire a video team. I want to do this the right way. Um, I started looking for like, a lot of people will look for someone who can do everything for them, right? Because obviously, if you get someone who's all encompassing, that means that's less time that I have to spend, which is a good thing. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people get it confused and get it mixed up when it comes to the whole all inclusive package. Because a lot of people like there are a lot of people out here who will do video and photo and this and that and all these other things. But what they don't realize, and this was what I found out when I was like looking around at different video companies, is that the company I hired is all inclusive when it comes to video, mm -hmm. not just everything. And so the way that translates is instead of having a company that does video and photos and then posts it for me and figures out the captions for me and figures out the hashtags for me, I have a company that we have our strategy call, then they go and put everything together for me. Then I go edit and make sure that our day looks good. And then they show up to my apartment with the cameras and they tell me what we're doing, where we're going, what we're talking about, all based off of the like two calls that we do mm -hmm. for every day of filming. And so then when we get there to wherever we're shooting at nine o'clock in the morning, the day of film day, 
it's like it is go time and we are on schedule every single time and then once we finish filming they send me like a week or so later a rough draft and they have this software where i'm just watching it and i can comment as i go with different different questions different edits different things that they need to think about or fix and and then the next draft is perfect and and actually the the video that i posted today um the full video that'll be next week for that which will be like my recap of 2020 and like the top five things about that how video affected my business in 2020 i didn't even need to give them any edits that's how good they are with it now wow and, and they so, learn, right? Like they get better. I mean, you talk about making the sauce with your selfie videos and we did the same thing early on. It was just, you get a little bit better every single time. And then it makes their workflow easier because they know that they have a certain level of expectation, but then you can let them get creative and you don't have to give them as much direction. You can just say, this is what I want to accomplish. And then they can be passionate about what they're creating, what they're doing. Right. And I'm sure there's a back and forth that happens between you guys now. Right. And it's like, because they're not, they're not distracted by all these other different things that they could be doing to try and make a little more money. They are so laser focused on video. Mm -hmm. And that to me is more important. I'd rather, I've got relationships with photographers. I'm friends with a bunch of photographers. So I don't need someone who's got their own photographer because I have photographers. Mm -hmm. I want someone who's going to help me not waste time trying to edit and trying to do all these different things with video that I don't know because that's taken time away from selling houses. And it's totally what you want. Like we had Brad McCallum on a couple of weeks ago. And again, he's somebody, when I think of you, I think of Brad, a high level content creator. He absolutely loves editing. He edits all his own stuff. I mean, you're talking about hours and hours and hours of work, but that's just something that he, he tends to love shooting and editing and chopping up. You know, I'm probably a hybrid in between the two of you where like, I love photography and I like video and I edit some of my own stuff. But honestly, I, I do love what I do from a real estate perspective that I want to be laser focused on working on every single file, moving the ball forward, growing the team. That's where my true passion lies. So I hire stuff that I may have a small interest in, but I know exponentially the people that I'm hiring are so much better at it than I am. So I can just come up with crazy ideas and they can execute. And then as a collective, you're, you're lifting your community up, right? And you're using, not using, but you're allowing people that have built up skill sets to execute on what they're good at. And I find companies are changing, right? It used to be very, you know, these conversations wouldn't happen. We're competitors. We're in the real estate industry. Why would we share these tactics and stuff? And that's changing. And now, you know, I've got photographers like Lemon Tree that are great at what they do in their space. And I've got, you know, a DP that does some work with me when I have videos that I want to execute on. And there's a community of people that we're all collaborating and sharing and, and giving contact information cross platform because we're all just doing what we do in our space, in our niche. And I find the more that you give, the more that you give back, right? Like when you're working with people that you know that may overlap in spaces, do you ever find that, you know, when you find people with the same mindset at you as you, it helps everybody build their business? Oh yeah. And that's, and that's where I think it took me a little while. It might've taken like a year, but like, it took me a little while when I first got into residential sales to get over the sales mindset and truly mm -hmm. develop a mindset where all I'm trying to do is just help people. And so when people get angry or get mad or anything, like it, it, it bothers me because when, like I had agents call me like dishonest and things before because they got screwed by something mm -hmm. that I didn't do to them. And it's like, like, why are they getting mad? Like, I, all I try and do is just fucking help people every day. Like, yep. that's it. And however they need help. And once you get to that mindset and you truly believe that that's what you're doing every day, that's when I think things really shift for you with the business and with everything. Because then it starts coming off like you earlier, you were asking about how things feel and can stay authentic. And it's like, that's why. Because I'm not doing a video with Lamborghini because because it's gonna give one more sale yeah. it's like it's like no i'm gonna do it because they're cool guys it's gonna help them because it'll get them more exposure it'll help me because it'll give me cool exposure and it's and they're and again they're cool guys and they're fun to hang out with and fun to talk to so why not like i, I do think that's where there's a big difference with 
you know, people that are doing it from a place of authenticity and they're co-signing people in their community because they genuinely just think they're cool people. It has nothing to do with, like, I've seen people do, you know, the Maserati, fo Maserati photos where that's not their world, right? Or portray an image of themselves online. And, and literally, like, we've seen this over and over over the last decade where, you know, somebody that's at the top of their industry creates something, you get a hundred people that go in, try and replicate it, create these digital courses online. You know, these people have no idea what they're talking about. Yet it just seems like an easy, you know, seven minute ab workout and an easy way to get into a marketplace, right? And I think there's a big delineation between what you're doing and being authentic about it and the rest of the world. And I think guys like you and I try to expose the world to, hey, I'm just trying to help you. Like, this is what that sales tactic is. And it's trying to take advantage of you. And it's not necessarily in your best interest. It's when you're not focusing on the money that the opportunities come. And then if you've developed a skill set at the same time as, you know, you're there for the opportunity, then you can execute and you're not worried about losing the file or just being needy because people can smell it. I think consumers are getting more educated. There's more information online, right? It's, it's very easy to sense that this day and age online. It is commission breath is a real thing. Commission breath. That's, I'm going to steal that and use that in the future. But yeah. I mean, that's where I, the our whole industry is changing, right? Like why are guys like you and I doing what we're doing? you know, in a space that has been so behind the curtain for so long, right? How is it that an industry that has so many preconceptions of it is changing so drastically in such a short period of time? And I think it's because people want authenticity, right? They want to work with Andy because Andy's a real human being. He's not a robot that's just going to, you know, tell him to buy something so he can get paid. So I think, you know, going into the future, how are you looking at your real estate business, especially, you know, with the world being what it is today? And how are you planning for 2021? Well, I mean, for the future, one of the big things, and we, we talked about this before I joined Pro with Sirhan. And I remember one of my first conversations with some of the guys over at Sirhan was about, like, if I want to brand and grow, like, how should I do that? Should I make like a company name? Should I brand around myself? Like, how do I do that? And they had told me, they were like, well, if you look at Ryan, he branded around himself because he, he's forcing himself to lead versus manage. And that to me was like the, like the aha moment where it's like, okay, well, I want to lead by the tip of the spear because I like to lead and I like being at the forefront of all of this. It's fun. And it's like, and it's fun helping people and interacting with all these different everybody versus versus the the complete opposite side where you know you're just dumping more money into to Zillow or Realtor.com or whoever. Which th there are a lot of very very successful people, so there's nothing wrong with that. For sure. It's just not how I wanted to to grow. And yeah, so, it's, it's a different business, right? There's I heard this on the weekend. You know, there's people that have an infinite mindset when it comes to their business growth and other people that have say a financial mindset or an exit strategy, I'm going to make this much income and then I'm going to go on autopilot, which is fine. You just got to find what you're passionate about and go down that route. But there's a question from the audience actually that lays up into that. And I think you can expand on this and says, what's the time frame for you to understand your brand? Like looking at you, even since I've known you, there's this constant evolution of your brand, right? Mm -hmm. So obviously there's, it took you some time to understand what that brand's going to be, but I'm, I'm sure it'll evolve. But how do you think about branding? As far as like the time frame and everything, I, um, <clears throat> it, it took a cup, like a year or two to really get going with that. And I think um, I'm trying to find out what I'm talking, but basically I remember when I first, so I was on a team when I first started in real estate. So that, that helped just with, being able to have mentors and peers that I could bounce ideas off of. But <clears throat> the big thing was once I left the team, I needed to be able to brand myself. And I looked at some of the other brokers that I was friends with who were successful individual agents. And literally their brand was so simple then. And I loved it. And so I created like my, this was like my original branding. Nice. It's just a signature and then it just says like helping you find your dream home, but it was like the signature. I put it on everything and I kind of ran with that. And so the idea was it's something simple. It's me. 
It's not anything confusing. I don't need like, you know, a, a name that people need to try and remember. Like my last name's hard enough to remember. So it's like, well, why not like just do something that's simple like that and, and looks nice. And then from there, then it was like, okay, now that's cool. But like, how can I grow from that? Well, growing from that would be like apparel. It's like, what can I do that would be good for apparel? Like, what can I put on a hat that my friends are going to want to wear that I'm going to want to wear that would look cool? And then that, I mean, that was when I came up with, with, with this one. Yeah, it's awesome. And so it's like, I put it on everything. I've got like, thank you things with custom branded, uh, like, uh, boxes and everything. And like, I've got the hats, I've got. Tank you just top. know, like you see it and you get that instant recognition and it's going to keep changing. Right. So to answer the question that we had from the audience member, you know, I, I think it was not so much how long did it take to establish your brand and get that brand identity. It was how long did it take to get that mindset switch? And it was a process. It didn't come overnight, but you know, now that it's there, I can tell you'll be looking at other branding and saying, man, that's a cool idea. I'd love to do that with, with my own personal brand and my own personal brand is a reflection of me, right? So I, I don't think it's ever going to end for you. I'm curious to see how it's going to go over the next couple of years. It'll be really cool. But that's the other thing too, is like too many people spend too much time on it. And so that's where like for putting these two together for, for this one, I hired, I went on a Fiverr and found someone who could create a logo and they actually have it when you go to like logo creation, they actually have people that do script logos. And so you pay someone 50 bucks and in two days you have three options that you can pick from and you're done. Yeah. Boom. You have a logo. And like with this one, my friend who runs a merchandise sales company who I use to buy all of this stuff, he had, uh, he has like a designer on staff. And so we were able to kind of go back and forth with a couple ideas. They gave me a few different options based on kind of what I was thinking with, with this idea in mind. And next thing I knew I had it, but it's like, I didn't spend hours upon hours and hours just thinking about what I can do, like getting ready to get ready. Like that's, that was, so one of the biggest things I learned when I was at Marcus and Millichap, when I was in uh, commercial brokerage, was that I was just, I was getting ready to get ready all the time. And that was why I never sold anything because I was waiting and waiting and waiting and preparing all the time, just waiting for someone to tell me that I was okay to go. And like, when I got into residential, it was like, there's no way that's gonna happen. I'm just gonna start and I'm gonna fuck it up and I'm gonna fail and I'm gonna keep going because I know what it looks like to wait forever to have someone tell me for, or for no one to tell me that, okay, like now you're good, go. And so there wasn't an option getting into residential, but with all this stuff, it's like, these all came through time and not, not through me sitting there for hours upon hours and days, like every single day, trying to figure out what the best brand is. Or like, I mean, we've seen some of the conversations with some people where it's like, well, should I do this one? Or should I make it should I make it red or should I do blue? And like, which one would be better? And it's like, who fucking cares? Just yeah. do it. Yeah. Should, I, should the line be like a three point weight or a four point weight? Right. I, I've always said, I'm like, you can name your company potato. If your service is amazing, people are going to use you at the end of the day and you can change your name. Like we had another episode with Sabina Malik early, early on the, or earlier on this year. And she reps like L'Oreal Paris, Apple. Like she deals with like high, high level companies. And I mean, people will pay big bucks. And she's in the branding space, right? She said, eventually, we're not even going to have logos. She's like, that's the way things are going. If you look at the evolution of, say, a Mercedes logo, it went from something super complicated to almost virtually nothing, right? Because you need to just be able to see the identifying logo and automatically know who it belongs to, right? So you know, overthinking that logo might not even matter in five years, and you should be spending that 50 hours working on your craft, your expertise, your client base, and delivering exceptional service. But, you know, just do the actual work. Somebody just jumped in. Jesse jumped in and said that. I'm going to loop back. I got a couple more questions. I'm going to let you go. Um, do, so the, do you use your personal account or do you recommend using your personal account for Instagram or your real estate or company or delineating the two? We kind of touched on that a little bit, but I'll let you expand on that. I have a, a business Facebook account and a personal 
but business Instagram. Yeah, and to Paul's- touch to touch on that, like there's some changes that Instagram has made for running ads where you can't run ads on Instagram if you're just using your personal account. So like even I did it where I separated on Facebook, my personal and my business, and then my brokerage. So say delineate them if you can. Um, the other question that Andrew Klauski had was, how long did it take you to find the right video company that fit your budget and put out the content and style you like? Did you go through a few or was it just you hit a, a bullseye the first shot? I got a little lucky. They, um, the company that I hired, they did, they had been doing a lot of walkthrough videos and they did a profile, like an agent profile video for me a couple of years before. And they had done a couple um, walkthrough videos for me for listings. And the, the owner of the company, who was the guy who FaceTimed me earlier, he's like one of my best friends. And so Amazing. they're open. They were very open to like trying things. And so I know that they had been I knew they were pitching the idea of this like vlog style, like full year long, 26 video commitment and no one had done it yet. And so it was kind of like, Hey, I have this idea and I think you guys can help me with it. Like, let's take a chance and see if it works. And like, it worked like his, his videographer is so good. And the producer is so on point with everything and so we now that being said the first handful of videos like you can see they're very different than they are now and it it was a learn a lot of learning that we had to do up front and they got pissed at me because i like it i when we first filmed i posted one of the videos a little early and it shifted their entire like our entire schedule up a week and they were (laughs) they were not happy but the big thing was that like we kind of took a risk together and I knew that they had good content or that they had good like videos that they could put out to the public. So it was like, well, like we'll give this a shot. Like they were testing it out. I was testing it out. We were kind of helping each other out because no one had paid for the type of package that I had. So Mm -hmm. they were more willing to be flexible with me and some of my needs, which, you know, some other people they may not be yeah and it goes back to the logo thing right you got an idea you execute your you could be burning money or it could be the best idea you ever had but you're not going to know unless you do it and remember our first conversation i said you know i like painting myself into a corner and regardless if i get value i'm going to make it work for me right but it's it's nice to see when things kind of come to fruition like that i got two more questions for you what is the what is one key to your personal branding for each of you when you started out that really helped you get momentum. What is one key to your personal branding just starting out that helped you get momentum? Simplify that. One thing that when I first started. Yeah, like if you boil down your personal branding, right? Like what's one thing that you did consistently in your branding or say your content that you think really helped you in the long run? Just starting with something simple. Honestly, I mean, that's where with, with this, it's like, it's so simple and it just, but it looked so clean and I put it on everything and like, I didn't overthink it. I went and spent 20 minutes on Fiverr and I found something that looked cool. And two days later I had a logo and a brand and it's like, and you, you engage. I think one of the big things too, is you engage without too many opinions or options engage with your your following and engage with your your people whether it's you know whether it's your 15,000 followers on Instagram or whether it's you know 500 people on Instagram and your 500 people on Facebook and then your family and your friends and your sphere like engage with them ask them get them involved like hey would you do you think this is cool or that's cool or, you know so when I went to do the script one, I, I put, I had three different options and I put it on Instagram and I got what I asked for people's feedback. And I mean, same with, and then with this, I had the idea and I, once I executed the idea, there were like a couple of random little things, whether or not, like I put this here or here or switched them or whatever, like, mm-hmm. you know, I asked some friends for, for help and that kind of stuff does help because then you start to just be able to stay top of mind with people because they you're now bringing them in on the process 
So keep it really simple. Don't overthink it. Engage with the people and think if you had 500 people in a room, you have 500 followers on Instagram, how much would you value that attention? But because you don't have 10,000 followers, you can't take the time to reply to people. Well, that's why you'll never hit 10,000 followers and then use people as a sounding board, your community, right? Like we know each other well enough. If I had an idea and I'm like, I need another look on this. It's as easy as a text message. And maybe I just need to talk to you. So I hear myself say it out loud. That's quite often what it is with people is they just want to say something and then realize, yeah, you know what? I really do believe that's the thing. So last question was Alexander Martin. Great stuff, gents. And definitely against commission breath. How do you balance pure helping approach with pushing the numbers and higher and higher deal values and volume? So I think his question is around growth, right? Like obviously you and I competitive, we want to be the number one agents on the planet. So we're always going to be looking to do more, bigger, better deals. But you know, how do you always keep that pure helping mentality while you're going through that growth phase? That was tough getting, getting going because when you're trying to just help and you're trying to grow and then you have a month or two with no sales, it starts to hurt. And so I think that the big thing is just, like like the like philly sports like you got to just trust this trust the process because truly like if you're helping people they like like what ryan surian says like if you if you take care of the work the work will take care of you and it, it's true like if you do right by people and you help people and you come from contribution all the time eventually it will come around and then like the momentum is a very real thing and so being able to grow from that, and that's where, like, even for me, like, I'll set goals, but at the end of the day, like, I'm focused more on what I'm going to be doing than on the fucking goal. Mm -hmm. because, I agree a thousand percent with everything that you're saying, right? Because, sorry, finish your thought around the goals. Uh, well, I was going to say, I just finished reading Atomic Habits, which if anyone needs a book to read, that is it. Atomic Habits. It is so good. And one of the things they talked about in there was that they said successful people and unsuccessful people, unsuccessful people have the same goals. And that was when like a light bulb went off and it was like, holy shit, it's because the successful people are the ones who are focused. They're actually, they're not as focused on their goal. They're focused on the work that it's going to take them to get to that fucking goal, not the goal itself. And so that's where I like to focus more on, okay, what am I going to do every day? What am I going to do tomorrow morning when I wake up? Or what am I going to do today? Now that I'm awake in order to get myself to that goal and not just think about this goal that I have that's up here. Thousand percent. I, we were literally talking about this yesterday, my wife and I, and we were talking about how when people just focus on the money, they lose sight of the bigger picture, right? Both. I mean, whether you're talking about the consumer saying, well, I just want the cheapest possible commission around, and then they sell their house for call it 80,000 less than maybe somebody with a different set of skills or different buyers or whatever could have brought them. They were so focused on saving 10 grand, they gave up 70. That's a real thing. It happens all the time. Agents are some of the worst in the world too, from the standpoint of they just jump brokerage to brokerage to brokerage, worried about their split and what they're paying the house and all this other jazz. They're so focused on the money. They don't realize that all brokerages are pretty much built the same in terms of what you're going to end up paying them. doesn't matter how they split it out or how they make it look. They're just focusing on their deal flow versus focusing on maybe a brokerage that can give them actual business and i think the brokerage model and you talk about the value is changing dramatically as well there's a lot of people out there kind of fighting over the numbers when you and i well know that the person that's going to succeed is the person that is aware of the numbers they've got it written down on somewhere but they also know the work that they have to do to hit those growth goals but they're not focused on the goals they're focused on the growth over time and they become unstoppable which is where i think you're headed right i think you know, why I said to you early on, you know, I, I feel like you're just getting started is you're going to look back on Andy today in 10 years and be like, man, like people thought I had it back then. I was just, you know, falling forward, but you're at least reflect self-reflective enough to understand, you know, that it is a growth journey that you're not necessarily where you want to be today, but I don't think you ever will be, but I, I'm super pumped to see that journey, man. And to be in your world and, you know, you got my support. If you need anything, anytime, hit me up and, Looking forward to doing this again because I feel like this won't be the last episode we've ever done. I appreciate that. Thank you for having me on. And dude, I just thank you for all the advice you've had over the last handful of months that we've known each other. Cause I was talking about some of our conversations that we had, like the very first conversation we had when at lunch today. 
and some of the advice that you gave me was very well um well put and it helped me a lot over the last few months and it helped me with my meetings with ryan and with all the cell like surhand stuff and just in general it was it was awesome so I don't even remember what I told you, but I appreciate that very much. That actually means the world to me. That's literally why I do this. So yeah, man, if I could be a small part in your story, uh, as you blow up, maybe uh, maybe we'll cross paths again in person someday once all this craziness is over. Yeah, we definitely will. Once we can cross borders. Yeah, I'll be on my way down there. I go down to Charlotte quite often. So <laughs> all right. awesome, brother. Okay, thanks again, man. You take care. Thanks, man. See you. Okay, bye.